father-in-law, one of the wonderful things one of the wonderful things about Zoom is having my father-in-law who lives in Seattle be able to be here too. Um, and I'm gonna read po new poems from a manuscript I'm working on. Um, and it's a manuscript about trash. So um, during the pandemic, like a lot of us, I took these really, really long walks. And, um, and I would look at gardens, I would look at houses, I would look at the sky. But more often, I trained my eyes on the ground and I studied garbage. And um, where I live in New Jersey, the, um, the towns are really close together. So you can walk to like three different towns in 20 minutes. It's very congested. So I would be able to walk all of these towns in a like couple hour walk and study all of this trash. And it became a thing where first I was just taking notes on the trash and I didn't really know why. I was just like writing down everything I saw. And then I began, when I came home, I would begin like thinking, why do I have all these notes on trash? Like I've got a list of 25 things I saw on the ground. Um, and then I'd begin to like shape them into something. And at first I didn't really know what it was. I was like, oh, I'm just keeping a list of trash. But actually in the end, it's become um, a new project and um, I'm working out a book of poems about it. It's also really interesting as a side note, the environmental um, piece of learning about trash has been fascinating. I never knew there's a huge incinerator in Newark that's burning, turning the sky pink, not far from my house. And I never knew about all the landfills in New York City on which public parks are now built. So that's also, I'm also writing about that. That's been really interesting, but the project really did start from um, my walks. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read a couple of poems um, from this project and they're all called Trash. Trash. Good you are trashing, my husband says, when I send him a photo of a plastic fork and an N95 I found on the ground beside the closed down library. And I know he wonders why I disappear for hours walking the streets of nearby towns. Walking is the only way to be reliably alone, though how I miss bodies, shoulder to shoulder on the E-train, that press and discomfort. Small pink tricycle, I type into my phone. Empty bottle of bleach. I track objects, look for the discarded. Behind the shuttered Our Lady of the Lake Chapel, flattened box of animal crackers, empty bottle of gin. Taped to a garbage can, a handwritten note for those who will empty it. Thank you and stay safe. Merlo Ponty once said, the body is our general medium for having a world, but I walk to outpace my body, to leave it behind with relief. In the church parking lot, an open bottle of emergency food from the county, bag of green onions, school-sized carton of milk. You are a bad mother, runs the soundtrack in my head. I can't give my girls faith in the future. Later, I'll drive to the grocery store in my mask and gloves, wait in line outside, fill the cart with food for my family, desiring nothing. I used up all my wanting in the early months, a year ago, when I bargained everything I loved away to keep my daughters safe. Now it's midwinter, the wind sharp edged, pricking my skin, the sky curdled milk. Now I walk to find the hinge in the world where I can slip back into the before. Last February, when we knew nothing, my daughters together in a light pooled room, together at the kitchen table. I think the body is a medium for nothing. Later tonight, while my girls sleep, I'll stretch out awake and shaking under sheets as if under the surface of river water. So um, one thing that comes up a lot in my poems, I realize is um, what it was like to be a parent of teenagers during the pandemic. Um, it was tough. Um, and I mean, the pandemic's ongoing, but especially in the early months when schools were shut down and kids were suddenly home and everything, it was really tough. So that's something that's gonna thread through as well. Um, and another thing that sometimes comes up in my poems is my mother's sudden death, which did not have to do with COVID, which happened in 2018. So. Um, this poem, which actually has the little New Orleans in it, uh, references that. Trash. In a dream, I drive the Huey P. Long Bridge in New Orleans with my mother. Ask how long she will go on being dead. 
How long have I felt selfishly uneasy in my body? And for what? Bottle of urine, pair of earplugs, a Mickey Mouse drum. In a dream, my girls are babies again and I devour them. An ear in my mouth, hunk of hair between my teeth to keep them safe. Green Lego block, oven door, caw of a restless crow. You ruined the world and now we have to fix it, my daughter says. We slide into silence. In a dream, I stumble in a lead apron, body too heavy to walk as if underwater. Deer graze on the empty yellow field behind the closed down school. My girl's disappointments settle in my chest, just as I felt their fevers as my own when they were small. A glue trap scattered with crickets, a license plate. At the edge of the Garden State Parkway, traffic rushes like a river, and I pretend it's the Mississippi, and my mother is alive in her New Orleans house. Older daughter Snapchats me, the world is ending. My boots chant the asphalt. I am sorry, I am sorry, I am sorry. So um, I'm gonna read two more poems. And um, the next one is about the experience of teaching during the pandemic. And what it's really about is I do teach at the City University of New York. I live in New Jersey, but I teach in Queens. And, um, and at my job, you know, I mean, everything shut down so quickly, right back in 2020, but my job was shut down by a tweet from Andrew Cuomo uh, rather than anybody telling us. So I like walked into class and my students were like, professor, Cuomo shut down the school. And there was like no plan for how to teach or what to do, or, I mean, I'd never heard of Zoom, which is kind of ironic. So, um, and my students were suggesting we have class on a gaming platform, like no one knew what to do. But I knew it was my last day on campus and in Queens. And I also knew that, um, or I sort of thought I would come back. I don't know, I bet a lot of us had this experience. Like I left stuff on my desk, like a water bottle and a folder. I'm like, I'll be back in two weeks. It'll be over then. Um, but this is a poem which is about the, um, the experience of the university shutting down on um, March, 2020. And it makes reference to some of the places in Queens that are near my university. Trash. On my last day of teaching in Queens in March, when the university shuts down, I walk Casino Boulevard as fast as I can, nowhere to go as if in motion I can find a plan for the rest of the ruined semester. Past the bodega and Dunkin' Donuts on the side of the highway, past the liquor store, past the dumpling shop. That afternoon I wrote on the board, Lucille Clifton said she wanted to write a poetry that would comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. My class sat in chairs built by the incarcerated in upstate New York the prisoners who make our hand sanitizer now. I wrote on the board, the tenor and the vehicle comprise a metaphor. The more distance between them, the better. Bodies at Elmhurst Hospital are shoveled into a refrigerated truck, trundled into a mass grave on an island. My student emails me, at the funeral, mourners were told to bring their own shovels to the grave to dig. My student emails me, the sirens outside my apartment never stop. At home, my daughter covers a wall with blackboard paint and it's smoky gray is solace. I give my daughters all the chalk I once used in teaching. Meanwhile, the death toll in Queens rises, the tenor and the vehicle, the epicenter of the virus is, I email my students, we will still gather in community. Poetry is still important. In the middle of the night on my phone, I read, the virus opens a seam in the world. Lovely metaphor, but I don't believe it. So I'm gonna finish with a slightly more hopeful poem. Um, you know, if you if you want to start taking a walk and staring at trash, there's no better place to start than your own street, um, which I, I live on a tiny like 
one block street in my town. It's a one-way street. And you'd be amazed once you start looking what you can find on that street. So um, so this poem, this last poem also makes reference to that. And, um, and it's also, I will say one thing, like I have learned a lot about where I live in the past two years in a way I didn't before because I would get on, the, I live by the train station. I would get on the train. I would go to my job in Queens. I would come home and I would walk in my little area. But I've walked all over now. Like I've walked in Patterson, William Carlos Williams Falls. I've walked in Newark. Like I've walked through um, pretty much all of the towns near me. And it's been super interesting. I never knew that my town had, a, the town near me had a Revolutionary War history. I've been in cemeteries. So that's really been something that a lesson I'm gonna take with me. And I still do this, by the way, like I was walking this morning. Um, it's a lesson I'm gonna take with me, which is like being grounded in the place where you are and knowing where you are. And, um, and I'm grateful for that. So here, is my last poem, Trashed. What does it mean to be present? What does it mean to pay attention? In March, sent home from my job, I walked to study gardens. Snapdragons choking a fence, azaleas threading spindled porches. Now I watch garbage. I left my town, walked to another less beautiful, town resembling the one where I grew up. Now I walk the hell strip. My student named it for me. Corridor between street and sidewalk. Is walking bearing witness? What do any of my walks do for the world? Louise Gluck wrote, at the end of my suffering, there was a door. Now there is no door. At home, my daughter consults a magic eight ball, shape of a skull, Ask again later. Tonight, she'll take my parents' Ouija board to her sleepover with friends. I miss my life, I don't say, because to speak it out loud is selfish. Yet one morning, at the end of my block, I find a door, tiny, purple, tall as a pack of cigarettes, nestled in a tree trunk by the last house before the street. Thank you. Great, Nicole. Thank you. Uh, when do you think trash is coming out? I don't know. I have a lot more work to do on incinerators and landfills to build around the poems, but and a and a lot more reading to do. But I got to say, it's been it's been super super interesting, um, and it's great to learn a lot more about the world through this project. It's also made me start composting, right? So it it's got a lot of good things coming out of it. Oh, that's great. That's really good. Um, there's one other thing I was thinking about, um, and now I, I forgot uh, what I was thinking about, but there was a question that I had uh, about that. Oh, you were talking about <clears throat> in New Jersey, do you live near Patterson? I go to Patterson quite a bit. I do live near Patterson. You can drive to Patterson about 20 minutes from where I live. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah Patterson's an amazing it is so amazing. I mean, the William Carlos Williams piece of it, but also just the mills. It's fast, totally yeah. fascinating. It yeah, is. it is. Okay. Well, thank you, Nicole Cooley. She does have some books out there. I would encourage you to, to check them out. And I really did enjoy uh, this reading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Linda Nemec Foster. She's pretty well known throughout Michigan and beyond. Um, and so I'm going to introduce her. Uh, so folks who may be unfamiliar with her know her work for over 40 years, Linda Nemec Foster, you know, it's amazing because she's only 45. So I don't, I don't understand this. Uh, Linda Nemec Foster has been a poet, teacher, activist, and advocate for the literary arts in Michigan. This is very true. She is the author of 12 collections of poetry, including Amber Necklace from Gdansk. Uh, which was a finalist for the Ohio Book Award. And am I, am I right, uh, Linda, that that was on LSU Press too, wasn't it? Yes, that was LSU Press. Yes, That's, another see. connection. Yay, I Nicole. know. That's what I thought of. <laughs> uh, Talking Diamonds, uh, finalist for the Forward uh, Book of the Year, and The Lake Michigan Mermaid, which did win a Michigan Notable. Her and Anne-Marie Uman did it. Uh, her work has been published in over 400 magazines, journals such as the Georgia Review, Nimrod, Quarterly, uh, Quarterly West, Witness, New American Writing, 
uh, Patterson Review, and, and many, a Verse Daily. Uh, Foster's poems have also appeared in anthologies from the US and the UK, been translated in Europe, inspired original music compositions, which I've seen, and have produced for the stage. She has received nominations for Pushcart, Pushcart. This is a push. <laughs> everything's push. You know, I saw Randy Newman, he did a song called Putin Put His Pants On. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, she's gotten an award from ArtServe, which we used to have here in Michigan as an award, Poetry Center in New Jersey, uh, Center in New Jersey, and the Academy of American Poets. Um, in 1997, this is important, her and her husband founded the Contemporary Writers Series at Aquinas. Uh, and it's a great series. They have great readers. I've been to several of these, uh, for, for, even though it's on the other side of the state. Uh, uh, Foster uh, served as the inaugural poet laureate of Grand Rapids. And in the fall of 2019, she was the poet in residence. And now that you know, you're throwing a curveball. University of Bielasko Biala in Poland. I said it. I'm impressed. Uh, yeah. Her. Her latest book, The Blue Divide, was published in 2021 by New Issues Press and has been nominated for a number of awards. A new collection of her prose poetry, Bone Country, is forthcoming from Cornerstone Press, which is a great press too. You don't tell me all these things uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Recently, Foster was awarded second prize in the Fish Anthologies International Flash Fiction Contest and was invited to give a reading at the West Cork Literary Festival in Ireland this July. Make sure you test positive, negative when you try to get home. I know, I Please. know. Because I got stuck. <laughs> I got stuck there for a couple of weeks uh, in March. Anyway, I please, know. please welcome Linda Nemec Foster from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Oh, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to read for you today, and an honor to read with Peter and Nicole. I'm, I'm big fans of your work. Uh, and these connections, Glastonbury, that P Peter knows someone who used to live on Glastonbury where our first son, Brian was born. And I have a poem about Brian coming up. But uh, anyway, um, I'm very, this is, whoa, it just flew out of my hand. Um, this is the new book I'm gonna be reading from the Blue Divide from New Issues Press. So the first few book, uh, first few poems I'm going to read from is from the Blue Divide, and um, you know I'm always con I always like to make connections with my fellow readers, my colleagues, and my poems, and so I'm going to concentrate on family poems: the mother and the child, the mother and the son, the mother and the daughter is big in my work, but I cannot deny um, what's going on on the other side of the world because all my family is from southern Poland. Uh, we've been to Poland nine times to visit this family. Uh, that's where I'm from. That's where my blood is from. Uh, a number of them live near the Ukraine border. So I still have a lot of family and friends in Poland that live near the Ukraine border. And they are right now in the firestorm and, and helping tremendous efforts with the refugee uh, crisis. I am so proud and uh, humbled with uh, what they're doing on that part of the world. So the first poem I'm gonna read is about where I come from. Uh, in, in America, then I'll, I'll talk about Poland in a bit, but um, all I can say is that um, I came from a very poor section of Cleveland, working class, blue collar, marginalized. It's called Slavic Village. And that's where a lot of immigrants from Central and European, uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe came to. And um, although those immigrants are no longer there, it's now the home for the new marginalized immigrants from Mexico, Central America, South America. So this is my neighborhood. And this is called the Immigrants in Slavic Village, Cleveland, 1955. The Hungarian kids wear thin jackets, missing buttons, stain of paprika in their mouths. The Czechs pretend they know everybody's secrets, even those of Slovak Joe who spits at their shadows. The Ukrainians can't stand the only neighbors who can understand their language, those goddamn Russians who starved their grandparents to death in the 30s. The Lithuanians 
refused to open the blinds after dusk. Something about the night air stealing the breath of infants and the poles, those men and women in love with the black Madonna washed their hands before touching their children, the sons and daughters as pale as water. At night, the moon gets tangled in the open arms of the dead oak tree on Salem Avenue and can't decide if it's winter or spring, summer or fall. The same barrenness, ways to embrace it every night. So that's my neighborhood in Cleveland. Um, but let's talk about where I came from. Um, first time I met Charlie Simic at a reading, uh, he said, I've, I've seen you before. I, I met you in Belgrade. I said, I've never been to Belgrade. I've been to a lot of places in Eastern Europe, but not Belgrade. He says, I've met you. And um, he says, you look so familiar. And he says, where are you from? I said, Cleveland. <laughs> and he says, no, 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 no. Where is your blood from? And I said, Southern Poland. And he says, that's it. You look so familiar. So this is a poem about that, about uh, the blood from, from my family. Family tree. There was the rain in the mountains of Southern Poland. Nova Sanch, the small town caught in history's time warp late 1800s, and are we in Prussia or Austria? What country defines this culture of peasants? By a great-grandfather, the only blacksmith in a village where horses outnumber people. There was the dense forest of intense bird song. My grandfather, straining to understand the language of dusk. Sparrows with their dull gray coats, complaining about the old world and its tight shoes. Get out, get out, they sing in unison to the man who gambles on a one-way ticket to Ellis Island, bribes the girl to the next village to meet him in two years underneath the orange sky above the steel mills in Cleveland. Say Cuyahoga, he tells her, as if it were a river that ran through her heart. There was the exotic smell of India ink on my father's fingers when he came home from work. Assembling printing presses as big as garages, he forgot the sound of words as they left the page. He was only interested in the machine's end result, capturing letters on an inked roller surface. By the time he died, he'd lost the language of village and rain. There was the echo of I am, the confused ego of the immigrant's granddaughter as she navigates the new world. She has never known the language of the old and she wants to be nothing but American, ageless, classless, careless. She negotiates a history, the compromise of opposites, how to immigrate from one world to another without realizing it. She leaves her impression, her empty outline on every major street in America home of the brave, last image of an anthem. There was the unrehearsed arrival of the sun, urban and urbane. No hint of the rain in the mountains, the fog forgetting itself. He knows only one language and uses it to reinvent the past. No history, only now. College and small rooms. He'll visit the mountains of Nova Sanch once and then instantly misplace them, a postcard in the very bottom drawer. So if I mention my son at the end of that poem, I have to talk about my daughter. I have a son and daughter, much older than your children, Nicole. They're adults into the world. And my daughter uh, studied astronomy and physics in college, which I can't even put my mind around. I can't. I can understand maybe a biology and chemistry, but not, not physics. So anyway, this poem is about a conversation I try to have with her about it. And it ends with the mother-daughter constellation Cassiopeia and Andromeda. 
And it begins with a quote from the planetary scientist, Alan Boss. And this is the quote, the universe really is a weird place. Unquote, Alan Boss, fog made of iron. Okay, listen to this. Astronomers just discovered a planet that is so airy. It has the density of styrofoam. And somewhere else there's a planet where the surface temperature reaches 3,100 degrees, where the gray fog is so dense, it's made of iron. Imagine the irony of iron raindrops. My daughter nonchalantly posits as she stirs her coffee. I respond with the simple nod. Yes, I can imagine this universe of irony where daughters turn to, where daughters turn from students to teachers, where mothers turn from lectures to silence, or even the sun turns on its axis without holding on. And the sky must release every cloud to become blue, blue, pure blue, before the dark night can release any star. Those small lights that outline Cassiopeia and her Andromeda. I want to go now to um, poems from uh, the new book. And the forthcoming book is called uh, Bone Country, as uh, ML uh, said from Cornerstone Press. And these are basically all prose poems, flash fiction, micro fiction, hybrid, and they're all set in different parts of the world, not America. And um, so I'm going to just read uh, a few, a couple from that new book, and then I'll, I'll end with a new, new poem. And uh, this is uh, actually the poem that I'll be reading in Ireland, if COVID lets me. And it's uh, in four very short vignettes, very short. So I will... Uh, you know, name the, the numbers as I go. And it's, uh, these vignettes uh, take place in Spain and Poland and Austria and Romania. On the other side of the world, one, after the funeral in Seville, two sisters go to a flamenco bar after they bury their father. They sit silently with their cool agua de la Valencia and watch each dancer as if they've forgotten sorrow and all its mismatched relatives, grief, mourning, the black scarf with white pearls. They're only aware of the dancer's feet pounding the floor, the insistent guitar, the bare arms twisting like branches of a willow tree. Each branch ends in a flurry of leaves. Each leaf cradles the twin shells of castanets, their dark ebony faces. Two, statue of a woman with broken serpents embracing her. She's totally forgotten in this Krakow park with its endless parade of harried students clutching cell phones and stoic grandmothers carrying plastic bags filled with potatoes, fresh dill, and coarse salt. Nothing hurried, nothing stoic about her, the anonymous woman cloaked in the blue patina of broken serpents. They cover her breasts and pubis, thighs and feet. The Madonna of the underworld, the anti-virgin of what is holy, even the sculpture refused to name her, keeps her eyes open, her mouth closed. Three, the train station, Vienna. The old woman wears a fashionable purple beret and collects free newspapers from three different kiosks in Vienna's main train station. She would be a bad lady in the States, but her scarf is too perfect. Its universe is serenaded by flocks of black starlings perched on bright yellow trees. What more can be said about the landscape she wears around her neck or the man on the train passing into the night who sees it? Four, the horseradish dish. Somewhere in Bucharest or Budapest, a place Americans can't find on a map, 
she finds the one restaurant that serves fresh grated white horseradish. When the waiter brings the spice to her table, she's startled to find its pungent fragrance trapped in a little coffin of pure glass. Be careful, the waiter whispers, what you wish for. Just two more pieces. Um, this last piece is dedicated to Zbigniew Herbert. He was a fine Polish poet, an amazing Polish poet, born in 1924, died in 1998. He was born in Lwów, which used to be Poland before Stalin took it after World War II, which Russians, I guess, do. So um, this is for Zbigniew Herbert. Uh, he lived in Warsaw during the destruction, uh, during those years of World War II. And this is a poem about the regeneration of Warsaw. And today is Orthodox Easter. And I'm hoping that this poem lives in the future in Ukraine. Because uh, as Herbert described World War II as a huge thunderstorm. So uh, this is for him after the thunderstorm. After the thunderstorm, a glaring sun and devastating blue sky fill your city. After the thunderstorm, only old men with talking parrots entertaining the tourists. After the thunderstorm, percussion groups from Warsaw perform West Side Story on vibes, drums, and xylophones. After the thunderstorm, buildings are rebuilt according to the original medieval plan and people return to inhabit them again to live, breathe, love, hate, die. After the thunderstorm, we eat special noodles cooked with chipped beef and buttered mushrooms. We drink iced water and strong beer. We're given an exorbitant tap for the meal, but pay without complaint. After the thunderstorm, we don't mind. After the thunder thunderstorm, we don't care about history or consequence, only about love, who has it and who doesn't. After the thunderstorm, we marvel every day at the rising of the sun, the clarity of the moon, the distant brilliant of the stars. After the thunderstorm, we keep looking at our hands to see if we're still alive. And yes, by the smallest of miracles, we are. We are. And the very last piece I'll read is a takeoff on Nicole's walking. It's a new, new poem written um, just a couple of weeks ago. And it's based on the news item of Sean Penn walking for miles to leave Ukraine for safety in Poland. Sean Penn leaves Ukraine for safety in Poland. 80 years ago, you couldn't dream of this scenario. A Hollywood actor walking miles past long lines of cars to the Polish border for safety. The same Poland that was engulfed in Nazi flames and crematoria ash. Fast forward like so many streaming videos to the now where Sean Penn of Dead Man Walking fame is walking toward a border town and getting the hell out of Dodge, Reed Kiev. He was in Ukraine filming a documentary about the Russian invasion until he wasn't. But let's get back to the irony of his walking towards a Poland that Hitler couldn't have imagined in 1942 with his long lines of women waiting for the showers in Birkenau, long lines of men waiting to be selected for work at Treblinka, long lines of children waiting for non-existent bread in Warsaw. In the now, Poland is on the other side of one history's nightmare. In the same now, it's neighbor to the east, Ukraine of the blue and yellow, of the sky and field, of the hands of the dead and their lost prayers is not. Once I visited a cemetery there on the border between Poland and Ukraine, stark and beautiful, green and calm, no dead man walking there, not even ghosts, only the long lines of graves and rusting crucifixes nailed to trees. But back to Sean, walking into the border that divides one history from another, passing so many cars, he's lost count. 
Thank you. Thank you, Linda Nemec Foster. Thank you. So much. Thank you. <clears throat> Make sure to read the All comments. Right. All right. I'm okay. Uh, thank you, Linda. And her book, The Blue Divide, is out and available. Um, is there still a Schuler's in Grand Rapids, Linda? You know, this is this is a conundrum of so many independent bookstores. Schuler's is a great, great bookstore, and it's still around. ML. The short answer is yes, but they've really uh, closed a number of their their branches. Uh, they used to have like three different outlets in Grand Rapids. Now it's only one, but it is their flagship store in Grand Rapids on 28th Street, and it's a wonderful independent bookstore. But you know, they're going through tough times too. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. so many places. Uh, they also have a store in um, Okemos, Michigan, which is near East Lansing where Michigan State is. I've been um, there. So there. There's that. But, um, you know, they really don't do as many programmings as they used to. I mean, yeah, now it's a Zoom world, but even on Zoom, like I don't think they had one thing <sighs> for National Poetry Month. Last year, they did host me for my Grand Rapids book launch of the, um, may I say, the Blue Divide. They they did yeah. that book launch in Grand Rapids last year, but for National Poetry Month. But this year, um, no, they, they, they've really cut, cut back in their programming, but they, they are still around. It's a great store, but- um, Okay, that's, uh, yeah. That's, I mean, uh, I yeah. wanted to know about that. I have a student from Grand Rapids. Uh, uh, she's been a, a teaching assistant this year. And I wanted to mention that to her. Okay. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thank you. Peter Cooley was born and educated in the Midwest, but born, I think, born in Detroit. Uh, he's lived over half of his life in New Orleans, where he was professor of English senior Mellon professor of English and director of the creative writing program at Tulane University. He's now professor emeritus, the former poet laureate of Louisiana. He received the Marble Fawn Award in poetry and an Atlas grant from the state of Louisiana. Uh, the father of three growing children, one of them is here, maybe the others are all here too. He published his 10th book, World Without Finishing with Carnegie Mellon in 28. He is the poetry editor of Christianity and Literature. And I don't know if you can see it, probably not, but this is his brand new book uh, that I saw a poem, an early poem come out in Commonweal, The One Certain Thing. So let's welcome Peter to read from The One Certain Thing. Thank you, ML. It really is a pleasure to be back in my hometown. I haven't been back here in Detroit since um, the year 2000, as a matter of fact. And Linda, we want these connections. You talked about living on Glastonbury, okay? I had a friend on Glastonbury, and this is the world that no longer exists. We lived in Detroit, and I would ride my bike over to my friend's house on Glastonbury, and my mother would say to me before I left, Call me if you're coming home for lunch. Just call me if you're coming home for dinner, okay? That's the world of safety in the 1950s in Detroit. It was like that. And I'm sure it was other places too. Um, I was thinking about my book this morning and I was I, what I really wanted to say is um, without being pretentious, this book wrote me. I didn't really write it. I didn't certainly start out to write a book about grief or about my wife dying. When I found my wife dead uh, in the living room couch on March 15th, 2018, I had no intention of writing a book of grief poems. And when I started to write the poems, I didn't think I was even writing grief poems. I am also a walker like Nicole, but not nearly the walker that Nicole is. I'm a um, short walker, <laughs> like around the block walker. And then around the block, I was looking at the crow that's always nesting in the tree outside my house. And this crow somehow was expressing the feelings I had at that time, just so, uh, 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 uh. and I thought, I think I'll write a poem about this crow. And of course, it, it turned out to be a poem about grief and death. And I'm not gonna read you that poem. In fact, I've thrown it away, it was so bad. 
But then I started writing about ordinary things and I realized what I was really writing about was a state of grief um, without knowing it. I started writing about things around the house. First visitation. When we talk to the dead, they answer or not. They have that choice, but we don't choose, do we? Yesterday, within the arena of my crying, I heard your voice, Jackie, gone two months. But you said, what? I couldn't grasp it. But then there is the other side, the dead talking to us through the mire of our unending tasks, the high wire of the checkbook, circumference of a scrub pot, or folding laundry, tangle and unmatched socks. I catch your voice and now you touch me here across my right hand, this second, the next. And as I write this, you're already gone. You refuse to leave. I'd never ask you to. Um, I think most men assume that they will die before their wives. Uh, I had that assumption and I, many of my friends had it until something happened. But I have formed in my own mind and in my own company, what I call the male grief group of other guys who lost their wives first. And my college roommate, Peter Halfholm, who also became a professor, um, lost his wife a year before I did and, and wrote he called me and said, there's really no word for us. They call us, they don't know what to call us. They call us widowers, but it comes from widow. There's no, there's no name for what we are. And that occasion, this poem, widower. There really is no word for us, is there? Widower from widow doesn't say it. Nothing says it except poetry, more crying. I'm not a widower. I was widowed, and now this imagery, all I have now, all insufficiency. This morning, when I woke up, you were here, an indentation in the sheets. You'd left to stay up the day in your study praying. And before that, in the middle of the night, I reached out to touch you or tried to touch, or was it you reaching to touch me? My lines are too interlaced with questioning. But what else is this hunger, not hunger, thirst, not thirst, this aching through my arms, my legs? How can I sing with the birds except to get up before first light again, to lay my words along, inside, beside, the song that breaks me up, assembles me. Grief has been something that's been very talked about nowadays because of the pandemic. In fact, when I started sending my poems out, because my publisher did accept the whole manuscript right away, some of the editors told me they liked the poems, but they wanted the pandemic in the poems. And I thought, I'm not gonna write and put my poems over again and just slip a pandemic in them to please you. So take them or leave them. In many cases, they left them. Some cases they took them. But this poem is, these poems are about private grief. And nowadays we like to talk about the public and the private. I think if you do the private well, it becomes the public. And I hope that's happening as you hear these poems. This, I had various visitation poems in the book as a structuring device. And this is one of the visitation poems. Mythos, a visitation. You must begin to die into your life, the morning said. But since morning only speaks like poetry to me and specificities, it was the trees that spoke, the trees along my street this morning sung, half of it ambling, their language demotic, the roots spread out across the world. Have you learned nothing from your wife's death eight months back, the live oaks asks me, followed in chorus by the sweet olive and willow. I don't answer, I don't need to. I must begin again as the sun begins to see these steps a dance I've never danced while the enchantment lasts, the trees speaking, 
It will play as always a few seconds. That's how the eons turn, the sun said. Now the trees were silent, each step, transformation. And I, you, one of the reasons for giving readings is that you see your poems in a new way as you read them. You even see things you hate about them. <laughs> and it's too late to change them as you're reading them. But what I see, you know this because many people here are poets. One of the things I see in these poems also is this tremendous sense of time that I have now as a result of my wife's death. We were married for 52 years. We lived together a year before that. So 53 years of being together. I have an acute sense of time and time passes. Now, the other side of grief is the ridiculousness and humor of the grief experience. And before the pandemic and after Jackie's death, people decided, especially since this coincided with my retirement, Jackie died in March, I retired in May. They decided they needed to fix me up or find things for me to do, like be a part-time teacher at a junior college. Um, or in the worst scenario, which doesn't appear in this poem, fix me up with an, another person my age who'd lost her husband. Um, very, very uncomfortable kinds of situations. Many of the things that appear in this time, as my students used to say, this really happened. These things are really true. These are really the things that people said to me. Uh, I've, I've written a lot of etude poems to studies, um, studies of this or that. And you know, the Rilke said in the famous Rilke poem that ends with, you must change your life. This starts with that. Etude, you must change your life. Though none or few have read Rilke, the well-meaners or mean-wellers tell me, I must change my life. Get a girlfriend, someone younger, 60, 50, 40. A neighbor I liked until yesterday who walks his dog each evening praising my lawn pronounces a 20 year old Peter for the changes. Others busy with my newfound retirement or freedom or boredom as they perceive it. Every diagnosis a register of their own malaise suggest a move to the lakefront in New Orleans, site of Katrina devastation or permanence in New Jersey with Nicole, Missouri, California, where our grown children live all of them busy, busy, busy. I could drive their kids to lessons, do yard work, dust, cook for everyone. But there is loneliness and there is solitude. From solitude comes poems I have written you, these brief poems. And I have hours and days when I can't eat or want to trowel ice cream out of the carton while watching the soaps and Dr. Phil or surf the internet for a new car, another friend's suggestion to slight grief. Most days I go on surviving with your presence. Every decision I make, I must check with you. Evenings as I read, here you are across from me. You told me to write this. Make it a light poem, comic relief. All right, I'm doing that. Now I'm going to write a grief poem. Now I'll read the gospel for today. Um, my wife was a very um, devoted uh, Anglo-Catholic and she really introduced me to the Anglo-Catholic High Church of uh, Church. Episcopal Church. Um, that was something we shared together. Um, and she is buried at the Episcopal Church in New Orleans, St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, where Nicole in fact went to school. I consulted Father Jim, the priest who did her funeral, and various other priests about what the aftermath might be like, and that's what this poem is about. Interrogation update. When will I see you again? I asked the priest. Father Jim says, when I die, that exact instant. Father Jonathan now, in these visitations, when I see you cross the living room and the scarlet nightgown I gave you last Christmas. You're here and somewhere else, he claims, referring me to Wikipedia, the garbled entry on quantum physics, a body in two places at the same time. Father Dave at the end of time, Father Ted 
when we rise again, every one of us. When is that, I ask? He shrugs, a mystery. Why do I keep questioning when you're here now, your presence in our shadowed room, the sun, appearing, reappearing this very second? Outside, thunderheads assemble a December. The light in our bedroom comes and goes, spilling goals on the familiars of our life together. Ancient bed, teak dressers we couldn't afford, but bought anyway to stay the course half a century. The rocking chair my grandmother embroidered with moons and stars where you'd lay out your clothes for morning each night. I take that distance light. I hold it with both hands. It's everything. Everything of you I get to keep. And my last poem um, really deals with um, what it would be like when I'm no longer here, when I am dead and um, I am searched out by what I imagine to be other people, and especially my children. Necessarily, the, uh, your wife's death makes you think of your own death, just as your parents' death makes you think of your own death. The one certain thing. A day will come, I'll watch you reading this. I'll look up from these words I'm writing now, this line I'm standing on. I'll be right here, alive again. I'll breathe on you this breath. Touch this word now, that one. Warm, isn't it? You are the person come to clean my room. You are whichever one of my three children opens the drawer here where this poem will go in a few moments when I've had my say. These are the words for immortality. No one stands between us now except death. I enter it entirely writing this. I have to tell you, I am not alone. Watching you read eternities with me. We like to watch you read. Read us again. Thank you, that's it. Oh my God, Peter. How are you not going to go out and buy this book right there? Yeah. <laughs> Once the one certain thing, uh, Peter Cooley from Detroit, Michigan, originally, and uh, been in Tulane and in New Orleans. I, I was actually, do, I did something at Tulane many years ago, probably, well, before Katrina. <clears throat> it was, uh, we stayed on campus. Uh, the Y put us up there or something. And we did a show in the student union, I think with uh, the musicians I work with and so forth. But I remember walking around there, but it was summertime. So I thought, well, I run into Peter Cooley here. Uh, it, but I didn't think you were running around campus in the summertime. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I want to thank you guys. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and hopefully we can have Peter and Nicole here in person uh, if this ever ends. Uh, that would be great. That would be great if I yeah, I'd, I'd love to have you up here. We will we will work that out somehow. If we have to put you in a space suit to have you read. <laughs> so. All right. So I Peter Peter I Cooley's know. new book, The One Certain Thing. Uh Lynn and Emick Foster, her new book is The Blue Divide. And Nicole uh Cooley is working on trash, but she well, that didn't sound right. <laughs> but you know, I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> now you must know the great book length a.r amon's poem garbage right that's yes I, that's ab the, absolutely this is the hip updated version of trash. <laughs> it's so punk you know it's trash <laughs> So, I don't know about that, but it might just be the version set in New Jersey. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, this is great. Thank you. This, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and I mentioned in the chat room, it is so, such an honor. I mentioned it before, but to read with Peter and Nicole, um, thank you so much. It was my, my pleasure, my privilege to be here with you. Thank that was great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Linda. It was great to read with you. All right.
Thank you, everybody. Uh, the dog is barking. The dog always starts barking when the reading's over. Uh, <laughs> Stella McCartney's barking like a mad dog. <laughs> Only five pounds worth of barking continues. Oh. But anyway, thank you, everybody. If this will be on Facebook. I will convert this into a YouTube and send it to everybody. Um, the next reading is going to be, I think it's May 24th. It's going to be sort of a Detroit, Chicago thing uh, where I started doing my stuff nationally. And it'll be Carlos Cumpian, Cynthia Gallagher, and uh, from New York City, but originally Chicago, Sharon Mesmer will be with us on that program. And, and I'll read with them as well. So you'll hear about that and some other things we're kind of planning. Uh, the St. Clair Shores Literary Walk uh, this year is going to be on August 20th, just for those who are local here. Um, that's the only Saturday we could get the park for. So uh, you'll hear more about that. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Peter, thank Nicole, you, Linda, thank Diane, you. Lonnie, Pat. Yeah, I feel like I'm in romper room here. I love it. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank ML. And thanks to you, ML, for putting this together. Yes, uh, I thank you, you so much. Good friend. Uh, My good, good friend. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Bye -bye. Nicole, call me. <laughs> Nicole, call your father.